Mi chiamo Keisa Latracci e state ascoltando il Cinematography Podcast. Perfect. I think it's great. Isn't that great? <laughs> I think that's fantastic. The following podcast contains explicit language. You're listening to the Cinematography Podcast presented by Hot Rod Cameras, a program about the art, craft and philosophy of the moving image and the people who make it happen. Coming to you from the world headquarters of Hot Rod Cameras in Hollywood, California, are your hosts, Ben Rock and Ilya Friedman. Hey, Ben. Hey, what's up? Hey, it's another exciting episode of the Cinematography Podcast. Some might say one of the most exciting. Certainly, Kay Zalatracci might say that. He might, because he is our guest today, and uh, we have been teasing having Kay's on the show for how many years now? I don't know, but it's definitely more than one. It's multiple Qu- years. Quite a few. Yeah, we've, yeah, it's probably since uh, our very first stretch of episodes. Yeah. So. So for those of you who don't make it to the end of the episode, which is where I usually uh, talk up Kay's a lot, firstly, go to musicbykays.com right now and leave him a a fucking message of any kind. S- say something. Kay's created every scrap of music you've ever heard on this show. Uh, the intro music, the transition music, blah, blah, blah. And he did that when we very first started doing this low these eight years ago. And the other thing about Kay's is that Kay's is, uh, I mean, I think I'm a generalist. I don't know even what I would call Kay's. Kay's does everything. Yeah, he's, so, he's kind of like a Cameron, like a James Cameron. He kind of like will go out to, to learn it all and do it all. It's freaky how much stuff Kays does. So he writes, he directs, he does visual effects. Obviously, he composes original music. He can do sound design. I know it's not his favorite thing on earth to do, but he can do it. And last but certainly not least, he color grades. And like he's color graded features. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, he, and, and this is the thing. It's like he doesn't do it all for himself. This is not him just doing it for his own project. People hire him to do these things, to do all these many things. And uh, he's turned a proficiency in a lot of different things into quite an eclectic career. Yeah. And he just directed his first longish form project that was a TV thing. I don't know. He talks a little bit about it in the interview. It's excellent. He's an amazing guy. He's someone who I've been collaborating with on one level or another literally since 1997, I think, is when I first met him. Which, uh, shockingly, what as it turns out, was a fucking long time ago. So, <laughs> in '97 doesn't seem like that long ago, but it was. No, I I think of 1997 as the distant future. So, <laughs> well, anyway, before we get to the interview with Kay's, uh, what's on our close focus today? Well, I think that we were both kind of going over possible uh, close foci. Foci <laughs> is, is that the plural of focus? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> focus. Uh, Focuses. <laughs> And we went over a few things, but something's kind of stuck in both of our craws that I feel like to whatever degree we can talk about it on our show and get people talking about it. And it's something that kind of seems to have come to a head on social media over the last couple of weeks, really. And it started, I think, with uh, the Rings of Power, the Lord of the Rings series, and also House of the Dragon. And then Disney released the uh, live action Little Mermaid trailer and it blew up. And what it is, is it's characters people think should be played by white people being played by black people. And in all three of these cases, they're all fantasy characters. And it uh, like I just I'm beyond myself to even imagine why anyone would care. Yeah, I really don't know. This is. You know, I remember actually when they redid Annie and they cast uh, a black actress in the role of Annie, there was outcry over that, too. It's like, is it, you know, that you have this white expectation because historically white people have played all these roles. And, you know, for once (laughs) we actually have a little bit of diversity in lead roles. And now what is it? The end of the world? Yeah. I, I, I don't know what to say about this. And I mean, like I bristle when people on the right start yammering about this or that being woke, which is like them having kind of co-opted a term that actually originates in the african-american community to begin with and so it's sort of just crapping on black people again for no reason but like people pointed out actually that in like the lord of the rings books J.R.R. tolkien wrote elves to be of different darknesses like he specified it in the freaking books but even if he didn't let's pretend for a second that J.R.R. tolkien said that they're all you know all elves are white people 
Uh, who cares? Really, from the bottom of my heart, who cares? Like, where were these people who were complaining about this when Johnny Depp was cast as Tonto? Yeah, it, exactly. Know? This is a huge double standard. And it's like, how often are white people playing all of these roles that should be played by someone of a different ethnicity? And those same yeah. people, you know, don't open their mouths then. <laughs> I mean, it's, uh, I, I don't know. Yeah, and, and I mean, like, I, to their credit, I don't feel like there was a hue and cry for uh, the musical Hamilton to all be played by white people people who reflected the white people that the characters were playing because part of the whole point of it was that they were being uh, played by a diverse cast. Yeah, I don't remember anyone uh, really getting bent out of shape when Jake Gyllenhaal was the Prince of Persia in the Prince of Persia. Yeah. <laughs> Clearly, <laughs> Jake Gyllenhaal, not Persian. So, Or when they came out with the all-women Ghostbusters in 2016 and people are like, you're ruining my childhood. And people like really get mad online. It's like, your childhood's fine. Go watch the original Ghostbusters. It didn't go anywhere. It's still there. Like, all I want is for the new Ghostbusters to be good. I don't care who's cast in it. And, you know, I think the same thing goes for fantasy characters, which are not based in reality at all. You just want it to be yeah. awesome. You just want it to be great. Yeah. Does it really? Mermaids, mermaids, elves, Targaryens. None of these are real things. Not real things, yeah. So. And I don't know. I mean, like usually close focus is great if you and I have some disagreement, but I feel like we're in lockstep on this one. And I really just don't feel like this is anyone making a political statement with their casting. If anything, people are always like, just cast the person who's best for the role. Well, when they went to cast the Little Mermaid, they ended up with someone who wasn't a redheaded white person in the role. Who cares? And I bet she's wonderful. I bet she's absolutely fantastic. Yeah, the trailer looks great. I mean, like I have my issues with live action remakes of Disney cartoons, but... Uh, and no one's putting a gun in my face and telling me I have to go, uh, you know, see these things or anyone go watch the original little mermaid. It's on Disney plus you can watch it, you know, till you're blue in the face, go watch the original game of Thrones, go watch the Peter Jackson, Lord of the Rings. If you want all white elves, you got them. They're already there. You know, it's not, it's not a remake, but it's certainly inspired by Corella is inspired by the Dalmatians and damn, is that great? That is absolutely great. And I don't, certainly don't mind them tinkering around with animated things and turning that, that live action. I know you've got, you just said you've got your issues with it, but I think that if they, they do the things the right way, they can, they can do it wonderfully. Yeah. I, I did not watch the remake of Aladdin, but I was like nothing against Will Smith, except that he slaps people on award ceremonies. But I was like, man, filling Robin Williams shoes in that must be next to impossible. And the Lion King live quote unquote live action isn't live action. There's like one live action shot in the whole movie. It's just a different form of animation and uh, Beauty and the Beast. I mean, look, man, if it's making money for Disney, who cares? These are kids movies. They're not aimed at me in general. So although I, I have to go see them with my kid. Yeah, that's one of the things, too. And, you know, let's hear it for the people who are making kids fair these days that are also looking out for the adults. And, uh, you know, I, I'm thinking specifically of Emmy Award winner Chippendale's Rescue Rangers. Have you uh, have you heard about I, this? I, I haven't seen it. I heard about it. Yeah, yeah it it's absolutely made by like Gen X people for Gen X's who now have kids. So that's really what it is. Oh, and uh, I do want to shout out on uh, the Little Mermaid remake, uh, live action remake, I guess, mm -hmm. is that the woman playing Ariel is Halle Bailey, which confused me at first because I my brain only gave me Halle Berry. And I'm like, there's no way Halle, Halle Berry can't play that part. Uh, but Halle Bailey. And if you go check out the trailer, she sings really well. And my only complaint is that she's singing with outdoor air acoustics underwater and bubbles should be coming out of her mouth. But. Uh, they, they're that's... taking a liberty. They're, they've taken the liberty that there's a mermaid. They're going to take the liberty of like, you know, blah, 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 Man, that would be funny to do, though. But, uh, but I'm not going to do it. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm definitely not going to. I mean, yeah, that's the thing is like there's going to be a talking crab in this movie. <laughs> like, why would anyone be upset too. about about realism? Or was it Hans Christian Andersen who wrote the original story? Like what he might have meant? Who gives a crap? It's just a very frustrating thing. And. And uh, anyway, uh, if, for me, my rant is over about it. <laughs> All right. Well, let's get to the interview with Kays. Here's Kays. The Cinematography Podcast Interview. We are here today 
with our amazing friend, Kays Alatracci. I have known Kays for nearly 30 years. And when Ilya and I first started talking about doing this podcast, I called up Kays and I begged him for a favor. I said, hey, Kays, would you be willing to whip up a piece of music for this podcast? And you did. That was in 2011. I remember exactly where I was when you first gave me the music. So very publicly, thank you for just being a constant presence on this show since it started. And we talk a lot about you on the show. I'm sure you've heard us uh, run our yaps about you because you are simply the most multi-hyphenate person I've ever known in my life. You started as a composer, you moved into directing, you moved into visual effects, you moved into color grading, and you've also done a great deal of sound design. But let's start at the beginning. Let's talk about the composing. What started you down the road of wanting to be a composer? Oh my God, where do I start? I mean, I'm originally from Italy. I was born in Florence and I was living in Italy and I remember, (laughs) see now I'm starting to date myself, but then again, I guess we're all kind of in the same general range. Well, well, quick aside, friend of the show and guest of the show, Seamus McGarvey, now resident of Florence, moved in there. So, so oh, wow. yeah, there's that's a, cool. like another connection there for you. Well, so. uh, M- maybe listening I, right now. I might be there in about a month, so maybe... Oh, you should hook up with Seamus. Yeah. So I was kind of like in my early, early teens and just starting to get into like records and music and things like that. And I remember going to like this music store, like this record store, and there was this LP. Uh, it was the soundtrack for Dario Argento's Inferno. Oh, that's a great soundtrack. Right. And it was uh, by Keith Emerson. From Emerson, Lake, and Palmer. From Emerson, I, I, Lake, and Palmer. I, I, I love it that a prog rock guy was doing scores for yeah. Dario Argento. I, I think uh, the score might be the best thing about that movie. I love that movie, but oh my God, that score is no, just you, fantastic. You shut your mouth. That's a brilliant movie. <laughs> 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 it's, it's one of my favorites. But anyway, what actually kind of grabbed me about that record was the cover, because it was like the poster for the movie, which is this kind of weird skull. It's it's like half a face and half a skull kind of thing. And it was really cool. I own it on Blu-ray. And and I think that like that's what kind of got me to like grab it. It's like, oh, I want this. I don't know what it is. I don't know. I don't even know what a soundtrack is, but this cover looks so cool. I got to have it. And then, you know, I went home. I put it on the record player, I started listening to it, and then all of a sudden I was like totally sucked in. I was like, oh my God, this is awesome because it's, it doesn't sound like anything like I had heard before. You know, it it wasn't like songs and yet it kind of connected with me and and I was like, wow, the soundtrack stuff sounds really cool. So the next soundtrack that I picked up, because then all of a sudden I was like, oh, I got to get myself some more soundtracks. Uh, The very next one that I got was uh, for uh, Escape from New York. Oh, nice. <laughs> John Carpenter. That's great. With his very uh, synthesizer. Do, 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 right. Yes. Very repetitive, but classic. It's like it's, it, you know, I can't think of the movie without thinking about, about that score. Yeah. Um, so the funny thing about me picking up all these soundtracks is that I couldn't go to the movie theater to see those films. So my only exposure to at the time to Dario Argento and John Carpenter was through the music. And um, unlike the Inferno soundtrack with Keith Emerson, who is like an absolute genius of the piano and the keyboard, and it was like, I can't play any of this stuff. The John Carpenter stuff, I had a little keyboard, you know, that my parents had bought me for like a birthday, and I could actually replicate that. I could replicate the Escape from New York theme because it's relatively simple and I could figure it out. <laughs> it ain't complicated. You know? It's probably about three notes, but that's awesome. So Yeah, <laughs> so, so that was kind of like my gateway drug. I, lo- I love John Carpenter's scores, but their simplicity is what makes John Carpenter's scores what they are. You know? Absolutely. That's true. And, I- excuse know. me, it's not simplicity, it's minimalism. It's minimalism. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> so that's, that was like my uh, gateway drug into soundtracks and then from that point forward it was you know Raiders of the Lost Ark and Close Encounters and you know all of the amazing John Williams soundtracks and uh, you know I was in love and, and of course like my first love is films movies I always say that there's two different types of film composers they're the ones that are doing film music because they love music and then they're the ones that are doing film music because they love film uh well i mean you know i'm sure there's like a lot of you know uh, might be one or two shades in in, in the middle of course uh but i'm definitely like one that loves films and uh you went to the berkeley college of music correct yes 
I, I feel like every composer I know went there. That seems like that's the nexus of composers. Do they have, do they specialize in film scoring? They do. As, as an aside, just uh, this past weekend, I went to the Hollywood Bowl to watch Back to the Future with a live orchestra performing the soundtrack, right? Oh, wow. And Alan Silvestri, who composed the score, and he's done like pretty much all of the Robert Zemeckis uh, films, he was there to introduce the score, and he went to Berkeley. <laughs> oh, nice. And not surprising, but I got to say that there was probably a good two years of my life when I would hear people talk about Berkeley. And I thought they were talking about UC Berkeley. Of and, course. And, and of totally course. not the same thing for anyone else out there who's making that, mis- might be making that mistake right now. No, Berkeley is in Boston. It's all on the other side of the country. And it's a music school. I mean, that school is, I mean, they've got a scoring composition thing there, but that that's like the school. It's Juilliard in Berkeley, right? This is, this is pretty much what it is. Yeah, with, with Juilliard being more focused on like the performance and, and a little bit more like the classical arts. Um, what I really wanted was actually to come out to USC mm. uh, because I wanted to be in LA because you know LA is like the you know the, the land of movies. I've never heard this. <laughs> it's where it's <laughs> happening since when, right? <laughs> but uh, unfortunately, and and I think this might be true to this date, although like uh, somebody correct me if I'm wrong. USC does not have a film scoring undergraduate program. I think it's only like a graduate program. And I really wanted to learn film scoring like as soon as possible. And Berkeley at the time was offering an undergraduate film scoring major. So I was like, I want to go there because I, I want to learn this stuff as quickly as possible. And, uh, and that's what I did. That's pretty amazing. Yeah. And so like I, uh, I feel like I met you. It's like 1996 ish, 97. It's been a minute. Something like that in Orlando, but you had been in Orlando for a while. And a lot of my friends at uh, the University of Central Florida, where I went to film school, had worked with you. You had scored a bunch of uh, student films. So was doing student work uh, like a way in for you, a way to build a portfolio for you? Or uh, were you working on other stuff, corporate or whatever else was going on in Orlando in the 90s? Okay, so let me rewind a little bit to kind of like build the context of why I ended up in Orlando. Why did any of us end up in Orlando? Go on. <laughs> I'm, I'm a native Floridian. I love Orlando, but oh boy. Anyway. So somewhere around the mid 80s, my dad had like a business opportunity in central Florida and he moved the entire family from Florence to Orlando. So because of that, I developed a lot of really great friendships that last to this day. Orlando was like my home base. And when I went to Berkeley, uh, every summer I would just kind of go back to Orlando because, you know, I wanted to hang out with my friends. I had like a band. I, I had a girlfriend in Orlando. <laughs> your band was, I, I lo- I'll never forget your band's name. It was called I Hate Furniture. Th- that came a little bit later, but yes, uh, that's, that's <laughs> true. <laughs> Wait a second. <laughs> It, it doesn't sound like that's just like the name of a band. It sounds like someone really does hate furniture. And like that's, I mean, Look, it, I, it was, were you the leader of this band? I mean, was this, this year? But, but I've been to your house and you have no furniture. So I think that that's probably still the case. Zero furniture. Uh, also, also, I want to bring something up that is probably not going to end up in the podcast. But <laughs> oh, just uh, there, wait. Th- there's somebody in the room next door that probably just about now hates furniture is really bad. <laughs> that, that's true. <laughs> it, uh, going on right now in the other room, there is someone uh, assembling IKEA furniture for hot rod cameras, and uh, it's not a task rabbit. It's a very nice uh, young man who I've known for a long time, and I have tried very hard to convince him that he can just go home, but he is building that IKEA furniture right now. <laughs> Of some sense of like, I, I, I don't know what it's obligation. There's no obligation here. Friendship. I, I, I don't know. It's like in male relationships. I mean, obviously driving someone to the airport is like third base, but I'm going to say that like probably <laughs> a helping someone to simple Ikea furniture is like second base, you know, uh, helping someone move. That's like going all the way home. Right. If I'm going to continue this baseball analogy and the bromance relationship. So it's like, I think he's elevating our relationship right now to, to heavy petting. <laughs> So this is a mm. this is something. <laughs> anyway, I'm sorry. Continue, case. <laughs> well, quite, sure how much quite a digression. More I wanted to hear that. <laughs> okay. So uh, this, where yeah, was I? So yeah, it might not make the show. <laughs> um, 
I was in Orlando. As a matter of fact, I would be remiss if I didn't mention that the band that I was in at the time, mm-hmm. the lead singer, his name was, uh, is Rob Thomas, and he went on oh. to uh, form the group Matchbox 20. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> Of course. Because yeah, uh, Matchbox 20, which had several big hits, you know, not that long ago. They're still around. The drummer for Matchbox 20 is actually doing the score for uh, for All Mankind, the Apple Plus uh, sci-fi movie. So it's, it really is like a bit of a crazy small world. Okay, so after I graduated from Berkeley and I had like this film scoring degree, I was trying to figure out, okay, wh- what do I want to do with my life? Where do I want to be? And uh, th- the most logical place to be would have been Los Angeles if it wasn't for the fact that at that time, in the kind of early mid '90s, all of the buzz was around Orlando being. Mm. They, they called it Hollywood East. Such right? a lie. Well, yeah. At but, best, uh, <laughs> at best, it was North Hollywood East. <laughs> but but uh, it, you know, Universal Studios was uh, you know building a bunch of sound stages there. Oh yeah. Um, Disney MGM, Nickelodeon. So the, the, there was a lot of activity there and I was like, oh my God, like this is amazing. Like instead of going to LA, I can go back to Orlando. I have a bunch of friends and it just made a lot of sense. So I went back to Orlando and as you do when you graduate, you're kind of figuring out, okay, you know, how am I going to interface with uh, filmmakers? What am I going to do? And I heard that UCF was running a film program and I thought, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to put up flyers at the film department of UCF, University of Central Florida. And I thought that would be a good strategy to get to know some new, exciting filmmakers. And because you did that, we're talking to you today. And if you hadn't done that, we would be talking to the drummer from Matchbox 20. Correct. (laughs) Paul. His his name is Paul Duchette, by the way. Paul Duchette. Uh, all right, so Kays, launch us forward here. What, what gets you out of Florida? Why, why aren't you still in well, Florida? Well, he hasn't even gotten into the nut meat of Florida yet. We, 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 <laughs> we, we, he hasn't gotten into, into meeting uh, and working with Dan Myrick, Ben Hirschleder, any of the yeah. characters that uh, put him into the seat that he's in right now. Didn't mean to gloss over that. Go go, go get, dive in, Kays. I put up my flyer, and sure enough, it worked. I mean, uh, I think like uh, Ben Hirschleder was one of the first people to contact me, and I ended up scoring his film called Tickets. I remember which, it well. Uh, it was really, really awesome. I think Ben lives in Atlanta now, right? He, like, he, I think he, you're right. He teaches there, yeah, yeah. yeah. Ben, Ben's an awesome filmmaker. He made uh, Tickets. He made an awesome film called Paul McCall. His main deal when he moved out here was he became uh, an avid editor, and then he became kind of an avid guru. Unbelievably talented, cool guy. I have to say that Ben was one of the people, when I was making my earliest films and I got stuck in some kind of technical quagmire, he was one of the lifelines. I would call him up and he would be like, I'll call this guy and it'll fix, you know, and 100% of the time, Ben gave me the exact information that got me out of whatever shithole I'd gotten myself into somehow. Okay. So, Case, what's up next? So, the very next person to contact me was Dan Myrick. And Dan actually had like this very interesting take of creating like a trailer for a feature film that didn't exist. So he just kind of went out and he shot little bits and pieces that you would see like in the movie trailer as if he had filmed the entire feature film. Mm -hmm. And um, Dan Myrick, future director of the Blair Witch Project said, hey. (laughs) Co-director. I'm interested in your scoring services. Co-director. Taking taking nothing away from Ed. Yes, but, uh, but yeah. And, and I have privileged information about this film because this film was shot by Ed Sanchez, the very same film. So he was the DP on that film. Yeah. Well, it, you know, it's, it's really interesting to me because at some point in the late 90s, I, I, early 2000s, I looked around me and I was like, I have more friends in Los Angeles than I do in Orlando. I need to be there. So, so that's what got me out here. So. And uh, have you regretted it? No, I mean, absolutely not. I get to hang out with you guys. Um, um, well, well, we're, we're all really glad that you, that you did make that move and came across country. It seems like, let me tell you, as exciting as Orlando was in the mid-90s for, for talent, uh, you, you throw a rock around this town, and it's like, holy crap. But it's like, yeah, this is one of those giant magnets for the industry that you just you, you can't escape. It's a, it's a vortex. It's a black hole of, you know, of, of talent and people and things. <laughs> and, and now... Uh, it's a black hole in a vortex. Yes, You're really selling it. Can we get you on the, on the travel brochure? 
I, I'm definitely going for a Ministry of Tourism badge here for uh, selling Los Angeles to, to, to people. But, but uh, Kay's, so you're, you're coming out here, you're composing music. Maybe at what point did you start thinking, boy, there's other aspects of this, there's other things I'd like to do besides being a composer, because you're, you're really accomplished in so many different fields now. Do you want the do you want the polite answer or do you want the love? No, that? no, we don't want polite. Are you kidding? Polite. Forget polite. Have you met yes. us? Either one Blunt. of us. <laughs> That's what we Blunt. want. Yeah. Without naming names, I mean, you know, I started working on some projects as a composer, and I felt that the decisions that were being made, you know, from the top were not necessarily the best decisions out what? there. I know. It I was know. Alien Raiders, wasn't it? Was. It was when you did the score for Alien Raiders. <laughs> Which, uh, for our listeners who don't know, that was Ben's movie. The alien, yeah. the alien should have had tentacles, damn it. <laughs> you were right. I mean, you know, I, I, I can't disagree with you. Uh, no, I mean, you know, I, I'm, I'm not really talking about anybody that, that we know, but it's true. Like, I mean, you know, I, I started kind of like, you know, getting more involved with like making suggestions, making, you know, beyond the music, you know, like editing suggestions like, oh, you know, like this moment would work better if you do this instead of that, you know. And uh, and for the most part, like it was met with a good, receptive, collaborative spirit. But yeah, but at some point I was like, I kind of feel like maybe I should try and maybe I'll fall flat on my face and maybe I'll I'll regret it. But at least, you know, I gave it the good old college try and, and see what comes out. And you were the editor on the very first short that I directed, Appointment. Yeah, yeah. So Well, and it should be noted, my wife was the producer. <laughs> That's right. The amount of really, really top-notch professional individuals that she was able to bring to this small little project that, you know, I, I genuinely had no idea what the hell I was doing. And yet, like, she brought all these, like, incredible talent to the table because, you know, these are all people that she, she worked with, including George Foy, who was the cinematographer for that film. We've talked about George more than we, once We've on never here. mentioned him on the show. <laughs> so. yeah. yeah, I mean, he was amazing. And, and honestly, I, I always kind of think back of the, the whole, like, Wayne's world, like, we're not worthy, we're not worthy. I was definitely not worthy of some of these people that came on board that project and they certainly made me look good for sure that's one of my favorite things that i've done and i was very very lucky we can uh we can put a link to it in the show notes uh appointment uh you know the, the stuff you do with vfx is beyond even most vfx people i know well thank you like but you're absolutely right the gateway drug for visual effects for me was appointment making a short film because uh, um there, there's this shot where the main character is uh, crossing a street and he gets hit by this car and the way we shot that was you know we, we put the camera like uh, on the sidewalk we had the actor run out on the street you know like making sure that there was safe there was no cars coming and then we told the actor okay get out of the shot and then we had the car drive into you know the, the scene and slam on the brakes and then what we did in After Effects, you and I, like we composited the two takes together so that it looks like he's getting hit by the car. And it totally worked. And I was like, oh my God, this is so cool. Like, you know, I want to do more. Yeah. <laughs> that's how they get you. That's how they get you hooked. That's, they, that's you, how you, they get Your you. first one's free. You know, you, you get to you have this good experience and now you're stuck in the VFX. Well, but that's not true though. It's not just VFX for you. You also have like, gotten into color grading you know what, what about some of the other stuff that you're dialed into here case right so after appointment and it had turned so well i was like oh my god this is exactly what i had in my mind when i wrote the script this is this is easy <laughs> so i got like really ambitious on the second easy. film and i decided to embark on this project that revolved around lucid dreaming and nightmares and demonic creatures and and that project was called in lucidity and we can post a link to that if you guys want as well let's do it and my plan with in lucidity was like you know i'm gonna shoot it i'm gonna you know like do some green screen stuff and then hopefully i'll be able to find some enterprising ambitious visual effects artists to help me out and you know, and at least kind of help me realize some of this stuff. And little did I know that I was so wrong. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> so after about like a year of just kind of looking to see if I could kind of find somebody to help me out with this, I just realized either I got to learn how to do it myself or else it's not getting done. And that's exactly what I did. I just, 
you know, little by little started watching all these YouTube videos and teaching myself After Effects, but also teaching myself, I think at the time I was uh, using Cinema 4D to do, you know, the tentacles. I, and, uh, and, and this is something I've always wanted to ask you, and I've never asked you in person, so I'm going to put you on the spot here. When we made Alien Raiders, and I remember you looked at the first cut of it or whatever, an early cut, and you actually said something like, couldn't you give the, these aliens like some big tentacles or something? Like you had made a tentacle suggestion. Right. And then when you did that in In Lucidity, I'm like, is this... Is this just cooking in your head since Alien Raiders? Is this, or is this, is this you <laughs> showing me this is how you could yes, have done it? Yes. <laughs> he, he just answered you. He says, yes, it's been cooking all of that time. <laughs> so. You know, this is where it's, it gets weird. It's like, I got a thing for tentacles. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. That, 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 that might be slightly outside the but, scope of the show. I, but I not by be, much. We won't be so uh, we posting your browser history. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> All right, but so yeah, absolutely. I mean, that that, that was kind of like floating around my head. I was, uh, you know, uh, in Alien Raiders, and and I was like, oh, I want to see that. I I don't know. It, it looked cool to have like this guy that's got like this weird, you know, tentacles that come out of him. So so that's what I did. And the same thing with the color grade for In Lucidity. I couldn't really find a colorist that would help me out, and I started thinking well let me see if i can figure this stuff out and, and didn't I did. we do the color grade for so. uh for appointment didn't we do it in apple's color grading software that was called color yes and george foyk actually color graded appointment and uh yeah th that was the thing to use back then it was apple color and then for reasons that I really don't understand, they discontinued that software. I think they just folded it into Final Cut. I think they just put... Yeah, that. I, th I think it's it's like a it's a part of the, the actual program now. Yeah. But yeah, it was Final Touch, then it became Color, and then Color just, I think, got you know, bloop, absorbed into the, the FCP. Uh, and I know that your your software of choice is DaVinci Resolve, but like gives you the same, the same capability. I, I mean... Here's what I will say, because I, I, I think it's important to kind of, I, I don't consider myself like having any kind of special abilities or anything that anybody else doesn't have. I do think that the software has come a long way. Oh, for sure. To allow guys like us to tackle, you know, multiple things. I mean, you know, for instance, like the, the CG stuff that I do nowadays I mean, th there's no way I could have done that in the 90s. It was just impossible. No way. Like, you know, like the, zero. And, yeah. uh, you know, same thing with the color grade. I mean, uh, Resolve, uh, you know, like the, the Da Vinci system, uh, not too long ago, actually, like, you know, we're talking about like 15 years ago. It was like, what was it, like a quarter of a million dollars? I mean, mm -hmm. it was insane. Yeah. Well, and Da, Vin so, da Vinci, so, yeah. like my introduction to Da Vinci was in a telecine bay. Like Da Vinci would be how you would color correct stuff as you were transferring it to video. It wasn't. And then later uh, they started doing uh, post color correction, like after you had a locked edit, but you would still be doing basically a tape to tape uh, thing and literally from tape from like a digi beta source or something like that. And it's only been, you know, maybe the last 10, 15 years where, I, I mean, I feel like Final Cut Pro really did open up that can of worms where they they put color correction rudimentary color correction in old final cut pro 3 i want to say but that enabled us to do so much more than we'd ever done before and i think that that kind of whetted everyone's appetite and you know whoever figured out how to how to take davinci resolve and turn it into an editing software like you know basically put everything into one box for people and at like one of the lowest price points of anything like I'm, I'm, a, I'm a big fan of Black Magic. I mean, I, I see them as a little bit like the Apple of the filmmaking world. They seem to be very aware of new trends in filmmaking and what modern filmmakers like us really need and really kind of want from from the gear, from the software, and they're keeping pace and exceeding our expectations. Uh, the latest version of Resolve 18 that has like this really brilliant functions like this depth map function, which is really, really cool, uh, which allows you to, you know, isolate the subject, you know, like say if you have an actor in the foreground and, and then you have like the rest of the background, it will actually use machine learning to figure out like, okay, this is where the actor is and then everything else it's kind of like in the background and allows you to for instance like create like a shallow depth of field effect just by putting the blur in the background and then keeping your subject nice and sharp and it's really really amazing technology and as far as I know 
<laughs> correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think Premiere has that function yet, does it? Uh, no, they don't. So yeah, I mean, kudos to Black but Magic. I, I will say Premiere has After Effects, which you know I think that the depth map thing is awesome, but the power inside After Effects is is basically unlimited. Now, incidentally, what Adobe does have that has really impressed me in uh, recent months is in Photoshop, there's all this new machine learning. It, it's kind of like experimental. It's like semi-beta, but it does some really amazing stuff. Like it does have the depth map uh, functionality in Photoshop. And one of the things that I did on this project that, that you know that I just finished working on I, I had like this uh, still of the actor and, and he's supposed to be dead. And, you know, and, and we kind of like took a photograph on set and he's kind of like staring a little bit off to the side, but I, re I really wanted him to like stare right into the camera. Mm -hmm. He's and lying you, on the ground, we should say too, by the way. Yeah, he's, li he's lying on the ground and I wanted him to like have this kind of like dead stare right into the camera. And in Photoshop, I was able to kind of bring the still of the actor and reorient his line of sight, which to me, like, kind of blows my mind. Not only that, that but that is you, can, you can change his expression. You can kind of make him, like, happy or sad or angry mm -hmm. or whatever. It's, it's insane. So are you, are you allowed to talk about the project that you're talking about? Do you want to go into any uh, detail about that? Okay, so uh, I'll tell you what I can say, and then, <laughs> and then maybe kind of be a little bit more vague on, on some of the things I'm not yet allowed to talk about. But uh, it's a horror project, it's a film, and uh, we shot it in Atlanta this past November, and I'm, I've just wrapped post-production. It's a piece of an anthology series, and I was brought on board to direct. Uh, this is a script that I wrote, and uh, I'm, I'm very, very thrilled about how it's turned out. It's, it's definitely like one of the projects that I had like the most resources. So for me, it's like a massive, massive step up, you know, to, to be able to do things that before I couldn't quite get done as well. So, Well, that's uh, sufficiently vague. It sounds like though you, you had a, a real crew and you had a budget and you, you're happy with how it turned out. Yeah, absolutely. Like I've, I've had like such luck in my relatively short career as a director to work with really amazing, amazingly talented actors. So that, that's really been a very fortunate kind of position that I've been in over and over to, to get to work with some really crazy talented people. I think Ben said this might be the, his most favorite thing of, that you've ever done. He's very positive about all this. No, I thought it. I thought it came out really well, and I think that one of the interesting things also to talk about, even though we can't show it to people yet because we don't know how and when it's going to be distributed yet, but um, uh, is is how many hats exactly you wore. So you wrote it and you directed it. <laughs> you did not DP yes, it. I did not DP it. You did VFX on it, so you 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 did a lot of VFX. There's tons of VFX. Uh, I would say uh, I'm pretty sure 80% of the shots are touched by VFX in some way. I did 90 shots. And and keep in mind that the format it's 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 a 30 minute episode. Yeah. So usually 90 shots is a lot even for like a feature film. Yeah. So yeah. There was there was a lot. So uh, and then you also composed the score. I composed the score. I here's something that I would I would say is like when when I compose the score, it's not because I'm like really precious about you know uh, wanting to like kind of have control over every little aspect of the film. It's more out of necessity. <laughs> so well, why? Because because you you could afford your own rate for for for, for doing it. It's uh, I mean you're a ro regular Robert Rodriguez over here. It sounds like there's yeah. like you know well, six different hats and, at least. And we're not done yet. Did you? You do the sound design i did the sound design too i'm uh, like w w once again it, it was kind of like a bit of a necessity thing uh i i personally wanted the movie to look as good as possible and because of that i specifically told the producers that i would take care of these elements of post if we could route more resources towards the actual shooting and uh you know just because i i knew i could do it you know, and I figure, well, you know, if we can save some money in post so that we can put more money on screen, you know, let's put more money on screen. And, cause, and, you know. and then rounding all that out, you did the grade, correct? You graded it. I, I did the color grade as well, yes. 
Like basically, the the only element that I did not do a post production was uh, the editing. Yeah. Even though you know I did the grade, I was greatly helped by the fact that the cinematography was just brilliant to begin with. So I had to do like very very little on the color grading side and uh, the cinematographer is this very very talented uh, cinematographer based in Atlanta his name is Chris Watkins just completely blew my mind as to how quickly he was able to move and the type of quality and images that he was able to bring on screen and I liked that he had a very minimalistic approach to lighting and yet when I look at the images that he shot I like it, it really feels rich and beautifully complements all of the action that's happening on screen. So I think you did a fantastic job. You did uh, most of the creative jobs except cinematographer and editor. And why those two things? Why did you not do either one of those things? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> why not? What's, what's wrong with you? Why can't you do it all? Yeah. <laughs> I, th I think it's important to know your limitations. What I love about film is that it's a collaborative art. And I feel very, very strongly that more brains is better. <laughs> it's not like a zombie. <laughs> <laughs> brains. <laughs> so that's the one thing that I've been missing, actually, from the process. It's not that I want to be in charge of all those things. Not at all. It's just that... As I said, like the projects that I've been working on for one reason or another, I haven't had like enough resources to be able to really, truly hire a bunch of people that I would love to work with, including, by the way, a music composer. I mean, obviously, I know how to score a film, but to me, I'm I'm still missing that extra mind, you know, that that comes on board that presents new ideas or new ways of looking at a particular scene or a particular moment. You know, and, and that's something that I look forward to. I hope that maybe on my next project or the one after that, I'll be able to, you know, to finally graduate to, to that point where I can really truly have a bunch of collaborators on the, on the film. So, yeah, I mean, absolutely. I think that's that's one of the best things about cinema as an art form is this collaborative nature. So for for me, like the, the doing... All this, multi, you know, wearing all these multiple hats and doing as much as possible myself has to do more with necessity than my personal desire as an artist to collaborate with other people. Interesting. And where does composing sit in your, you know, composing, which got you into the business in the first place? Where does that sit in your like, how much do you want to just score somebody else's film now? Or if you were scoring another film, would you constantly be like, oh, man, they should have kept that close up going longer? Like, would you be thinking more like a director than you used to? Or when you score something, are you just able to just kind of turn that part of your brain off and say, OK, here's the emotion I'm going to tug at with this music right now? As, as a matter of fact, um now that I'm done with, you know, my directing of this project, the very next thing that I'm doing is actually scoring a feature film. And I'm very much looking forward to that. I'm very much looking forward to just being a composer for a little bit. And usually when I'm hired as a composer, I, I don't approach it like, oh, I, I could do better than that or I could make different decisions. Uh, not at all. I mean, uh, to me, Composing is all about interpreting what somebody else's vision is and trying to elevate their vision, um, create through music, you know, the emotional connection with the audience. And um, so, yeah, absolutely. I mean, when, I, when I'm working as a composer, I work as a composer. Uh, okay, well, well, Kays, I don't really think I have anything else. I'm really glad this is long overdue. This is this is a this is a long overdue process. I'm really glad that we are finally able to make this happen. And I'm sure that our listeners, at least our hardcore listeners, of which there's at least one or two, who have been uh, hearing us talk about you for so long, you most certainly have been a, a probably a question mark in the back of their their brains. And now, <laughs> uh, hopefully, that question mark is is somewhat answered, and they get some sort of understanding of of who you are and and what it is and uh, someone else for them to follow or reach out to if they need composing or all kinds of other stuff like that. Well, so. and uh, yeah, and, and we've been plugging your your uh, website uh, ever since our first our very first episode. Uh, have you gotten any correspondence from any of our listeners over all these Has years? Anyone ever reached out to you? <laughs> no. <laughs> oh my god. 
<laughs> not a single one. Wow. No, okay. Not a single one of you jerks out. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just, I'm just kidding. Yeah, I, that's that's I, a sure way to get someone to reach out. Yeah. Uh, on, on as, honestly, I'm, I've been so slammed with all this stuff. That maybe, maybe it's not such a bad thing that nobody's reached out. Um, one of the things that I was going to mention is that like, if there's something that is far overdue and something I've been talking to you guys for a while is... Uh, you know, maybe we need to have a 2.0 version, you know, for the next season Ooh. of your podcast Ooh. as far as like, you know, new themes. Oh. And I have ideas. All I have right. ideas. So, <laughs> uh-huh. so listeners, stay tuned for uh, the, yeah, you the, know, the next season, you know, the cinematography podcast to hear the, the, the great rebrand. Yeah. yeah. Maybe you could do something uh, wildly different. So, well, wildly well, different. We'll yeah. go with polka. Yeah, polka. <laughs> maybe yeah, something uh, weird. Klezmer weird music. <laughs> hey, I've been really listening to a lot of Zamrock lately. So yeah, <laughs> if you if you know Zamrock, that that I don't. Oh, it's great. It's rock from. Uh, it, you just just Google it and listen to it. You'll you'll enjoy it. There's oh, there's a playlist okay. I'll share with you. I won't I'll tell you anything about it. Do it, do it. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, well, thanks, guys. Thank, thanks for having me. This has been fun. I know we've been talking about it for a long time, but you know, I'm glad we finally got to do it. Before we go, yes. we, we got to ask you, where can people find you online if they want to see more of your work, hear more of your work, experience the the world of entertainment that is uh, K's Alatraxi? Where can they find your stuff? Okay, so there's several ways. So one of it is, uh, if you're interested in music, uh, my website is Music by K's, Music B-Y-K-A-Y-S. Um, if you're interested in my movies, you can probably guess that my <laughs> website for films <laughs> is Movies by K's. <laughs> ah. Fiendishly clever. And if you're interested, because I've gotten so much into like CG and people kind of start asking me questions and I figure, you know what, I'm going to start my own like YouTube tutorial channel. So I have a YouTube tutorial channel where I teach people about like visual effects and CG and that is called Right Brained Tutorials. I had no idea. I yeah, so you that. can find that on YouTube. I, I have, I've seen a couple of those and also didn't you for a time do tutorials on making Hackintoshes? I did make tutorials on uh, on how to make a, a Hackintosh. I did one way back when on how to update the CPU in that old the old cheese grater Mac Pro. If, if, oh. Which you did for me. You you I literally got yeah. the uh, I, I I bought the processors uh, I, I, and I brought them over to your house and you you did it. It was uh, uh I I was never more terrified that my computer. I got would one in the other ne- room, case. Can you take it with you? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I still I still get I, I'll get email I'll get messages from YouTube that people watch that video of updating the old Mac Pro CPU and they're like, oh, you know, I'm thinking about putting this. Like, what do you think? Like, you know, do you think I should do it? And my usual response nowadays is like, just get yourself a Mac Mini. They're so much faster. <laughs> yeah, that's true, <laughs> and, and you, r- relatively hassle-free. So yes, yeah. absolutely. And they're not that expensive. You can get a Mac Mini for like seven or eight hundred bucks, I think, right? Even less. Like, they're Amazon's got them on sale now, so it's 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 great. Like, great machines. They're fast. Oh, and also. Stop using Final Cut 7. <laughs> Please. <laughs> well. <laughs> All right, this sounds like a, this sounds like a soapbox moment here. So this is <laughs> There are still people who still use Final Cut 7 and and it and it is super weird to me because that software I believe has not been updated in 15 years. <laughs> That's right. Wow. Wow. Cuz like when Final Cut Pro 10 came out, they were uh Final Cut Pro hadn't been upgraded in about 5 years, I think. I may be off by a year or two, but still. So, and then they just murdered Final Cut Pro as it was and replaced it with this, uh, whatever Final Cut Pro 10 is. I mean, Final Cut Pro 10, you can, you can do good work in it. I know people love it. So I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to yuck anyone's yum here. Use Final Cut Pro 10. I don't care. But man, oh man, if you were Final Cut Pro 7 user, when that came out, it was like the biggest middle finger <laughs> Uh, that I, I've, I ever received as a, as a not just a user of a piece of software, but as like an evangelist, as someone who wouldn't shut up about it. I can I can attest to the fact that you wouldn't shut up about it. But uh, but na- but now you you don't sound bitter at all. Tell me how you really feel about this. So. <laughs> uh, anyway, Kays, this has been so much fun. I'm really glad that it we got been. to do this, and I can't wait to have you back on again. Well, thank you so much. Maybe I'll come back when we have like the new music for the show. All right. All right. Yeah, we'll do it. All right. All Thanks, right. so- guys.
So that was Kay's Alatrachi. So happy to finally have Kay's on the show. And again, I can't stress this enough. Go to musicbykays.com and go to wherever it is that you can send him a message and just say, hi, Kay's. Uh, appreciate the fact that you made music for the cinematography podcast in, uh, you know, what, 2013. Or, or say you. something controversial because Kay's, you know, he'll, he'll mix it up on Facebook every now and again. If someone says something that he's, you know. Oh, that's like, true. Oh, someone says something like, oh, you know, I... Da Vinci Resolve sucks. Or I, oh yeah, I, tell him anything negative about any Black Magic product. Yes, he, he loves will. everything Black Magic. And oh man, you, and boy, just watch out. The can of whoop ass is coming for you. Mm. So <laughs> he'll 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 go to your house uh, and uh, congratulate him on the new puppy. He got a new puppy. Oh, that's true. He did get a dog. All right. So Ben, you'll get to ever guess what time it is. Oh, uh, what time is that? That is bill paying time. It is a time where probably a percentage of our audience goes, oh, where's the 15 second, 30 second skip button? And then they, bloop, and they go right past <laughs> our, our commercials. But but hey, you probably shouldn't do that because I'm going to talk about our fine sponsor, Aerie. Aerie, maker of all kinds of cool technology. And uh, if you're not aware... Airy has a division called Airy Rental, and Airy Rental rents some stuff that you can't get anywhere else. Now, uh, perhaps most famously is their 65 millimeter format camera, the Alexa 65. It's only available for rental from Airy Rental. They also have a couple of other cameras, though, that I don't think most people think about, which is a historical film 65 millimeter camera called the Aeroflex 765 available for rental from Airy Rental and wow. also uh, a very special camera the Alexa XT B plus W which stands for black and white it is a special higher resolution higher sensitivity higher dynamic range black and white camera and if you go to the page which is uh, airyrental.com and click on their exclusive Uh, cameras, you'll actually see a selection at the bottom there of some of the projects which have used these cameras. And they do some really, really good, reliable quality stuff. And I think it's worth uh, calling a shout out and uh, congratulations to them because there's not a lot of people who are making, you know, custom gear and then uh, putting it out to the industry in a non mass market way, trying to recoup their investment in the R and D through sales. They're doing it uh, purely through rentals. And there's only a few people who do that. And it's uh, it's really cool. Well, and they are, as we talk about it a lot, like one of the biggest, most iconic names in the camera business and lighting business for that matter, and have been since kind of the beginning of filmmaking. And now short ends. So Ben, it is our short end time. What's your obsession this week? What are you what are you into? What's tickling your fancy? Well, I don't know how, exactly how to put this. Woody Allen is set to retire from being a filmmaker and he's made 50 movies, 50 movies. I don't know if that's a record. It definitely isn't. There are people like Jim Wynorski who are making more movies than Woody Allen. That's true. Quite a legacy. Also, Woody Allen, not an untarnished legacy, like, uh, you know, kind of veiled in horrible scandal for the last, you know, whatever, 25 years of his career. But he kept making movies. And I feel like it's an interesting case study in that, like, there's something kind of distasteful about him. But that did not stop top level talent from working with him because working with Woody Allen was not a guarantee of an Oscar nomination, but a sickening number of actors got Oscar nominations or won Oscars after working with Woody Allen. And he is definitely a one of a kind voice. Some of his movies have aged better than others. For sure. And I guess I'm tap dancing around it, but there is kind of a sexual abuse scandal about his adopted daughter. And then there was also kind of a quasi scandal that I think people are less freaked out about about his wife's adopted daughter, Soon Yi, who he married when he was like in his 50s and she was like 20. Something like that, yeah. Early 20s. Uh, But they're still married. So I'm like, okay. Uh, Part of me is like, well, I guess it worked out. You know, like she's she's my age. At this point, she's not a a 20-year-old rube who got suckered, but was she groomed by him to do that? Eh, It's quite possible. I don't know. The personal stuff, like, you know, he has not been found guilty of a crime. I don't have the distaste for his work that I would have for, say, Roman Polanski. Mm, sure. Um, anyway, so his uh, next film is called Wasp 22, and supposedly that will be his last. He's 86 years old, so... Yeah, maybe it's time to stop, you know, spending so much time in the edit suite. Time to, well, and I, time to do I also, like, I don't know that he's been especially relevant, although he's the kind of filmmaker who, like, after hearing nothing from him for a long time, even though he's turned out, like, literally, like, one movie a year, every once in a while, he would just pull one out, like, 
match point or something that got everyone talking that was a well-made compelling film and it was interesting uh, there's an interview that he did for, with uh, IndieWire or IndieWire at least presented it and he's part of the reason he's quitting uh, is that he's complaining about movies not playing in theaters as long and going to streaming sooner which I think is a weird non-complaint it's like go wherever the audience is dummy but you know there was and still is i guess you know like a big halo around making movies that play in theaters versus making movies that play on tv screens and you know he is definitely of that generation yes for sure and you know i think his his career is uh is interesting certainly i think some of his movies hit a lot better than others some i think are, are real head scratchers and others are pretty darn incredible but uh you know uh, overall i don't think i've liked a lot of woody allen's more recent stuff so I, I don't think i'm i think the last thing i saw from him that i really liked was midnight in paris so yeah i don't think I've... midnight in paris was good match point was good uh and blue jasmine 2013 i thought was actually excellent um, and you know, movies you know. like Match Point are like it's a by today's standards a very low budget movie. It's like maybe a fifteen million dollar movie, and it's yeah. kind of incredible. You know, he's got an amazing cast because people line up to to work with him. Like uh, you know, in that movie, Scarlett Johansson, Brian Cox. Yeah. I mean, you know, r- really uh, an incredible cast. And uh, I don't think they're doing it for scale, but I'm sure they're probably not making their their big time quotes, their HBO and Marvel quotes. It's I mean, they're I think they just really wanted to work with him. So clearly, there's a lot of people out there who have uh, nothing but warm fuzzy feelings about. Uh, but about well, and, I, and I feel like for my money, his best run starts in the early 80s with 1983's Zelig and includes things like Broadway, Danny Rose, The Purple Rose of Cairo, which might be my favorite of all of his films, Hannah and Her Sisters, Crimes and Misdemeanors, and kind of ends, in my opinion, in 94 with Bullets Over Broadway. And he's got more good in there than bad. Some of his movies aren't my favorite, but like Crimes and Misdemeanors. Uh, Husbands and Wives kind of happened as his marriage with Mia Farrow was falling apart and people accused it of being kind of too self-reflexive of what was going on there. But you look at him and it's like the Purple Rose of Cairo kind of gives us Jeff Daniels. Mm. Like that's like his breakout role. I mean, I know I, I know he'd been around since before then. Uh, Mighty Aphrodite gives us Mara Sorvino. I'm not even really touching. There's so many on this list. You know, movies like Shadows and Fog, I think is very underappreciated as kind of a weird nod to German expressionism, which is like, yeah, not exactly a catnip for mainstream audiences, but it's interesting that he took his work and slung it that way. And, and I start with Zelig 1983, which I think is a really funny movie, but also is very innovative with visual effects. And like when Forrest Gump came out, people compared it to Zelig a lot because Woody Allen like put himself into scenes with Adolf Hitler and stuff like that. And as disgusted as I may be with him at this moment as a human being, like I do feel like he's a formidable filmmaker. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I understand. You've got uh, you got a bunch of mixed emotions, but uh, but yeah. yeah, you won't have him to kick around anymore if he really does retire. I, I, I won't. <laughs> Maybe we can get him on the show. You can you can talk yeah. to him about. His, oh, my God. That'd yeah. be crazy. You know, my father interviewed him for radio in the 60s when he was a stand up comedian. Oh, really? And my father said they couldn't broadcast the interview because he cursed every other word. Oh, all right. Fun. So so that would be a really weird set of bookends. That, that really would. Because I would be the one cursing. That's right. <laughs> I'll be saying, this is for Alan Rock. And he's going to be like, who? Who? When? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I don't have a good Woody Allen impersonation. so I, I, have, I, I wouldn't even try. So, uh, Ilya, what is your pet obsession of the week? All right. So we're going from uh, Woody Allen to an anime series based on a video game. So talk about Whiplash. This is a hard, hard right turn. My short end this week is a new Netflix series called Cyberpunk Edge Runners. Have you heard of okay. this? Has he, has it appeared? I, I have under? not heard of it. Okay. So this is not for the faint of heart. This is gory, violent adult anime sort of action. I'm in. I'm in. Yeah. So so maybe you would like it, but Here's the thing. It is set inside the world that is created in a video game that came out just in the early days of the pandemic. I think it came out in April of 2020, and it had been long, long promoted because 
uh, one of the main characters in the video game is played by Keanu Reeves. And it is a okay. m- massive I remember this. open world uh, game. It was called Cyberpunk 2077. And Keanu Reeves comes out at the E3 convention at uh, in Los Angeles to announce it. And I want to say like October, November of uh, 2019. And it had been teased for so long. People didn't even know when this game was coming. They only knew that he was in it. It had a huge, you know, huge budget behind it. And it was going to make this debut soon. And they announced the date. And you can go watch all this stuff on YouTube if you're if you're so interested. But that's all besides the point. They've essentially now taken that universe, that that world that uh, is sort of like this fractured version of Los Angeles in the future they call Night City. And Night City is a land of like lawlessness and really, really bizarre human, you know, augmentations and surgeries so that basically anyone can have these sorts of superpowers by modifying themselves and becoming a cyborg. And everyone's got these chip slots and information is transferred. But regardless of the world, it is just like a visceral visual experience and Ultimately, there's this underlying theme of the more that you are modifying yourself away from human, the more that you are losing your humanity and the more likely Mm. it is for you to go completely crazy. And this is a I found that to be the case in my own life. Yeah, I I was going to say, I'm sure that uh, you've experienced in in my case, it was just getting an Apple watch. But getting an Apple watch, you lost, you know, it it was basically like a horcrux for you. Your soul got split and became less human. (laughs) You you started caring less about (laughs) other people. Yeah, I've noticed this about you. you. Were you a glass hole? Did you have the Google Glass, too? I never had the Google Glass. No. Okay. I remember when Google Glass came out, I was like, you know what I need in my life? I need a heads up display putting crap in front of my eyes all the time. I, I need to never have an open field of view ever and also uh, look like a chode. I want all those things. Here, here's the thing about the cyberpunk edge runners. I'm not 100 percent sure that if you never played the video game, you'll have uh, the same experience that I had because I did play the video game. I don't play a lot of games. I'm not a gamer, but every once in a while something comes along and I will play a bunch of it. And this is one of those games that I played a bunch of when it first came out because, hey, the pandemic was in full swing <laughs> and uh, it was like, uh, who knows uh, what was going to happen next? So this sort of like yeah. very nihilistic, you know, dark future sort of Blade Runner esque world and that also happened to feature Keanu Reeves and a bunch of other stuff was really really freaking cool and you could you know spend a bunch of hours sort of like exploring stuff in it but the fact that they they came out with this series and it's uh, it's like a it looks like a joint project with a bunch of Japanese animation uh, studios so it very much has that you know Japanese anime style and it's also just kind of got this loud punk rock aesthetic even the credit sequence is just like it at the the beginning, it gives you the option to skip the credit sequence. You should at least watch it once. It's a really, really beautiful credit sequence, even if it is in this sort of like dark and distorted, uh, you know, fractured view of the future. Uh, mm-hmm. It's it's uh, it's worth taking a look at. And since you didn't play the game, I'd really be curious to find out uh, what you think of it. Uh, I'll check it out. It sounds cool. Is Keanu Reeves on the show? He is not. So this is set in the same world, but it's not the same story as the video game. So it's clearly if you played the video game, you will recognize settings and vehicles and sort of the iconic character styles that are in this and a lot of the same Mm. stuff they use the same there's a lot of uh slang that they created in some ways it feels a little bit like something out of a a coen brothers because you know they're saying words that everyone kind of understands and you understand initially too but it's like what was that it's not exactly what i was what i was thinking they were going to say it's very Mm. it's it's stylized so and and again violent it it reminds it'll remind if you don't watch a lot of japanese animation uh you'll think of something like akira when you see this or you'll think of ghost in the shell you'll think in some of these you know they have lots of bullets lots of explosions lots of stuff it'll it'll feel very much in that sort of world fun you know i'll definitely check it out cool all right ben well i think that just about does it for another episode of the cinematography podcast where can people find you if they want to find uh, you outside of this show please go to benrock.com just the way it sounds go to benrock.com you can find all my social media hookups there and hit me up on twitter linkedin facebook whatever you won't find me on tiktok yeah yeah that's where to find me uh Ilya, where can people find you uh, you can find me over at Hot Red Cameras, hotredcameras.com, and also LinkedIn. I've had, God, this just in the last 
week or two, I've had a couple of people reach out from the podcast on LinkedIn. And one of them thought that Hot Rod Cameras rents equipment. No, Hot Rod Cameras does not rent equipment. We do sell equipment. That is not a an uncommon mistake, but I probably should every once in a while mention the fact that we're where you go to buy stuff, not necessarily where you go to rent stuff. There's lots of fine companies that are rental companies that buy all their gear from Hot Rod. The, all the biggest and best rental companies, plus many of the smallest, they, they buy from us, but we don't actually do any rentals. I'll gladly point you to one of those companies if you can rent <laughs> something. So. so Ilya, who do we need to thank this week? Uh, let's thank Alana Cody. Alana Cody, uh, producer of the show, our showrunner, uh, as it were, uh, who's working on all kinds of uh, new things for us right oh, now, we, including... we got a great one coming up really soon. I'm so excited. I'm so excited. I'm so excited. <laughs> it, it'll, it'll be really great. Yeah. And then, of course, let's thank Kays, who did double duty as composer and guest on our show today. Yeah, in, in true Kays form. He's on the show, and also this is all his music. That's right. So and uh, and let's thank Ben. Thank ben, ben, ben Katz, Katz. not yeah, me. Not, don't thank not me. you. No, Please. no thanks to you. No, of course thanks Please to you. Please don't thank, thank me. Thanks to Ben Katz who has edited this together to make it not sound like a giant sloppy mess. You know, I uh, <laughs> someone re- recommended another podcast for me to listen to the other day. I tried it. I tried it for a good ten minutes, but just the lack of absolute trying to edit uh, made that podcast un- unlistenable to me. So so anyway, re- regardless, oh I, if people like that sort of thing where people just kind of ramble on and on and on, uh, great. Hopefully Ben Katz did a good job of cutting out the uh, the boringest parts of our conversation and only leaving the good does. stuff. Yes, that's true. All right. Well, that about does it. And we will see you next week. Thanks for listening. This has been the Cinematography Podcast, presented by Hot Rod Cameras. Find your next camera, lens, or accessory on the web at hotrodcameras.com. Don't forget to subscribe to our show on iTunes and connect with us on Facebook and Twitter. Thanks for listening.